Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. And joining us today from iFanboy and all about Android, Mr. Ron Richards. Thanks for having me. It's good to be on the show. It's a three-peat for you. I have three Twitch shows today. in one day, and yeah. I get to hang with Brian, so that's even awesome, right? That's a little bonus. Yay. Hey, uh, big thanks to Rabbit Badger and uh, Hate Bad Design, who both independently, like Convergent Evolution, sent us our opening video today. Yeah, no, I love the way that came out. Uh, obviously, if you were audio only, it might have been hard to tell, but it was uh, made up of all movie clips, and it was uh, half the fun is recognizing each of the individual individual clips and in the chat room somebody shouted this is going to be taken down by a thousand different content providers yeah <laughs> you've been like found so in violation of the following list it's going to be huge it's kind of awesome though like, yeah that was that i was impressed that, by that it's the definition of no. fair use yeah that a truly mashup. is yeah, you're not yeah. undermining you're transforming and it's somewhat parody yeah. i mean it's being used to make a parody totally so yeah so there you go all right uh let's start off with the big story This just in, the big story. YouTube is starting to roll out their new entertainment channels. Uh, they've got one, Entertainment News Television, a co-production by Ion TV and Penske Media Corp. And the Young Hollywood Network, also kicking off its daily 1 p.m. offering of celebrity interviews and showbiz theme programming, as well as Reuters launching a web TV channel and bringing 10 new and original shows to YouTube. So now this is all, uh, this is live content or pre-produced shows that are just being released on YouTube or both? I think it's a combination of both. I mean, this is part of the whole push towards channels that YouTube's doing that I feel like we, you know, back when I was at Revision 3, and I'm sure you guys hear about it, we've heard the rumblings of this for a while, and it's finally happening now that YouTube is, like, rolling out these channels and with the announcements that happened in the fall. Um, I think, you know, they're leveraging their live platform where they can, but I think the majority of this is just this coordinated programming that happens at a certain time that you can always tune into, which I think is really overdue. Yeah, the, these, these are all part of the media partners, the $100 yep. million dollars that YouTube that, threw fun. people to produce yep. original content. Yep. Uh, I, am, I am really surprised to see so much energy going into live stuff. Now, there is certain aspects of live that are so very, very important. But when you look at uh, part of the reason that YouTube doesn't display the number of current viewers is because uh, I, I think maybe I could count on one hand the number of times I've ever seen a live stream on any platform of any event that had more than five digits of simultaneous viewers. By and large, it seems like a lot of the live views are, are very, very uh, 
uh, like maybe one percent of what you would expect a, a hit for a packaged video to be. What do you think the allure is to putting all this effort into live? Well, not all of it's live, Brian. Some of it is actually just streamed at a particular time. Scheduled. So yeah. you tune in at 11 p.m. to see the show when it first hits YouTube, and then after that, it's available. But on they demand. are pushing live. They are pushing streaming live stuff. I mean, which which Brian, you know, Brian, you do have a point. I agree with you. I haven't seen you know more than thousands of people watching. But I think this is part of if you look at what Google and YouTube are doing in a bigger kind of landscape and admittedly I'm a bit of a Google TV uh, fan so I'm going to push it where I can but you know they're rolling out Google TV they're really trying to take over and we're seeing the shift finally happening of um, live television to the internet and now that finally broadband's in all these homes and you've got these devices that can handle it um, I think you're going to see a lot more trying to use the internet to deliver live television whether it's a concert or if it's some entertainment gossip show or something like that where they're training people now to come to YouTube for channels at this time and then every now and then one might be live and they're testing it to see how it goes but this idea of coordinated programming as opposed to on demand which is funny because we all love the internet and net you know, uh, you know unplugging from cable because we can watch our shows whenever we want to so it's for some reason they're pulling it back to scheduled programming. You can only watch the show at 2 p.m. or whatever time. Right. Now, there's t there's two things that I noticed. Uh, number one, uh, if, if YouTube is going to really pull this off, it seems like they're almost kind of uh, following in the footsteps of the Twit model, you know, because Twit, obviously, most people watch a lot of the programming after the fact, either as a podcast or on demand. But, uh, but for the people there, it's the electricity of watching it live and being part of the chat room and knowing that up to the very second, this is what's happening. Uh, YouTube has to do something to create a version of the chat room because right now what they do is they're, they're just using the, the comment system and there's a reason that the YouTube comments are notorious for being so vapid and horrible. Uh, I mean, that, that's why we talk about where Max Trollbot came from. But uh, uh, the, the other thing that I noticed is I like the fact that you've got new properties that are born of this new medium with the Young Hollywood Network, but you also have established stuff like Reuters. I think Reuters is a natural fit for this type of content on this kind of platform. And let's not give people the misimpression. Most of the content will not be live. Right. What YouTube is after here is not the Twit Network at all. In fact, that's one of the reasons Twit isn't part of this, is because it doesn't fit their model. What YouTube wants, and what most of these are doing, is a strip of programming, Monday through Friday, you tune in at 5 p.m., and you get the premiere of the episode, and then you can watch it whenever you want from then on. Right. Uh, it's not exactly appointment television. It's kind of appointment television, because it's just sort of a release time when the new show comes out. Uh, and I know it looks like uh, Entertainment News Television will be doing some breaking news uh, that will be live. But Young Hollywood Network, it's talking about a strip of programming. Reuters talking about a strip of programming. So they're not so much going after live channels as they are going after appointment viewing. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, like I said, they're, they're replicating the television model via YouTube. And um, Brian, I think your, com your, your comment about the comments in YouTube is, is totally accurate. And I, do, I was at a party back in December, and a friend of mine who's a developer at YouTube said they are working on the co comments and they are working on integrating more social features and things like that. So it's clearly coming. It's going to happen. Um, but it's absolutely going after there's, appointment. They there's want got to be some way to uh, have a reputation associated with your account because there is there are certain people who, uh, because of the abject an anonymity, there's got to be a way that if you have a reputation for always having downvoted comments that aren't helpful, that aren't uh, that aren't uh, contributing or whatever, that they don't show up quite as often or you have to actually seek them well, out. Well, think about it. Have you noticed in all, the, in all the YouTube redesigns, have you noticed how prominent your little Google Plus guy in the upper right-hand corner is? I, I think it's great. I think I think it's I think there's something to be said for stripping away some of the anonymity. Or or if you do want to remain anonymous, at, la at least at least let it remain a consistent identity. Like yeah. if you're you know if you want to have three accounts, that's fine. But know every time that you're going to troll with one of them, it's going to be remembered. Now before you go too far, let's let's not take away the entertainment value of reading the YouTube comments because that is one of my oh, favorite things oh. to do. <laughs> oh my God, about your own show? Maybe yeah. not other shows. But otherwise, like I. Have the internet once I tweeted out like would you rather get paper cuts to the eyeballs or read YouTube comments it was 99 to 1 in favor of paper cuts on the eyeballs <laughs> I, I have uh, YouTube set to send me an email when somebody comments on one of the iFanboy videos and stuff like that just to see what people are saying and that sort of thing and it's the highlight of my day when I see that email coming because it's always wow. hysterical <laughs> YouTube comments give me paper cuts yeah. on my eyeballs <laughs> exactly uh, <laughs> now one of the reasons I'm excited about this YouTube stuff is uh, that we are finally seeing big productions of video meant for the internet. Not, it's not like it's the first time we've seen it. You've been doing it for years. Yeah, exactly. Lots yeah. of people have been doing it for years. But, but this is momentum building 
on the level of networks, yep. budget-wise, not just, you know, talent-wise. Because really, what platform could do this, could get away with it? Right. You know and, what I mean? and I've been saying for years that the networks will lose their stranglehold on, on controlling all the programming and 28-day and delays and now 56-day delays and all of that when other companies come in and start doing big-budget programming and saying, hey, we know how this works. We're just going to give it to you, and you can watch it wherever and whenever you want. What I think is most interesting is that, do you remember, it had to have been geez, like a year, year and a half ago when YouTube started offering um, movies and TV show rentals and things like that? Do you know anybody who uses that? No. I, no, nobody. No, no, no. So what they did was they said, okay, we took your content and we put it on our platform. Nobody wants it. Yeah. So now we're going to create, you know, we're going to work with content providers and have them create content for us. We're going to get the eyeballs and then I bet you like a boomerang, that content's going to come back and they make a go for Hulu and things like that. And Because they, they, YouTube wants you to be, it's YouTube, the only place on the internet where you watch a video. That's what they want to see happen. And this is what they're trying to do. It's just a chess game. What we want uh, is funny. for frame rate in like two years to be commenting on video that's on the internet yep. the way that everyone comments about video on television. Right. Brian, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that it's awfully convenient that he brought up Hulu because if I'm not mistaken, that is another big story. <laughs> Stop everything, it's another big story. And that's right. YouTube is not the only entity making original programming for the web, uh, launching its first ever original scripted series. Now, they have had an original uh, unscripted series. Maybe. It's a reality uh, show. More, kind more of unscripted. Than, it's so I mean, it's, it's pretty much unscripted. I mean, pretty much, yeah. Talk, it's uh, but this is edited. a full-on drama <laughs> scripted series, 13-episode uh, story arc of Battleground, a political comedy following the campaign trail of a third-place candidate in Wisconsin who's angling for a Senate seat. Uh, again, this is so fascinating to me to see this brand new battle, this this flight quality where you got. Uh, I guess the main players we have right now are YouTube, of course. Uh, Netflix, we've been talking about for a while. Hulu Plus, and um, uh, di didn't we have a story about Amazon? Prime having some kind of original content, scripted stuff as well. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't remember, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're not going to get. They're going to get in the game as well. I mean, these are these are the new MSOs. I mean, these are the new. They should be. They, they are. I They've mean, like, got yeah. the power. They just need yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They've got the eyeballs. I mean, between between Netflix and Hulu alone. I mean, Amazon Prime. <laughs> Amazon's definitely making a go for it. You know, plus with you know the Kindle Fire and all those kind of devices to watch video, and they're pushing for it now. But I think Hulu and Netflix, you're going to watch them battling, and I think it's I think it's great for on, for video. It's a, it's another opportunity, especially as a media creator. It's another place for us to go to try to get a show published or released. Let's it's also the sign of a maturing medium, and I think that's one thing. We're all cheerleaders for new media, and this is the type of conflict that you hope for because it's an indication that uh, that enough people perceive there's enough money in it that it's worth pouring big, big gobs of cash. What's What did it say here? Uh, I guess the second story we had here, Hulu's 2011 revenue grew 60% to $420 million, and they're going to invest $500 million into content this year alone. That blew me away. Number one. That Not all of that original so, content, let's yeah. be clear. But yeah. Still, yeah. Still, things. Still, but still, yeah. I mean, uh, doing major, 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 major buys. Uh, I, I'm so surprised at and how much they still have to operate at a loss because it's this giant land grab to get eyeballs. I mean, I, it's exciting, but it's also... I don't know. I, I don't know how to feel about it. Well, I mean, I, I think the important thing, and, and, and we're you know looking at the article in TechCrunch that talks about it, and they make the good point that comparing it to Netflix, Netflix did $822 million last quarter. Wow. Well, that does put it into perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how much did CBS do last quarter? How much right. did ABC do? How much right. did HBO do last quarter? I mean, these are still very small potatoes yep. compared to the incumbents in the space. But the, the point to look at is it rose 60% yeah. at a time when people are like, who is a bunch of crap? Well, and, I'm not paying for Hulu Plus. And, and you, they still rose 60%. And really. you also see you coming out of a scenario where Hulu was, you know, it was an acquisition target for most of last year. There were rumors that it was being shopped around and, there, and Google and Amazon and everybody was in talks to buy it. Um, and it, what you see here with this announcement is that, okay, we made $420 million, We're going to spend $500 million to get content. That's a commitment to say we're going to make this business work. And we're going to, you know, it's clear. We, all, we know that content is king. And people are going to come watch where the content is that they want to watch it. So clearly Hulu needs to invest all the money they're making into getting that content to pull my eyeball away. Because right now, I'm going to Netflix to watch my show. They need to steer me away from Netflix and get me back to Hulu. 
So even though I do believe I pay for a Hulu Plus subscription, just in case. I just but, keep putting it on hold. <laughs> really? And every time the hold expires, I put it on hold yeah. again. Or i got to look at that. I need to go through my bank account to see all the micropayments that I'm paying. <laughs> this is yeah, probably Ron, a lot. Uh, I actually, so you are a subscriber to Hulu Plus then? Yep. And and what is the number one reason that you do it? Is it so you can watch stuff in the living room, or is it for, for the increased uh, back catalog of shows? Why why pay? Uh, it's a, it's a couple of things. I think one part of it is a personal putting my money where my mouth is. Whenever um, whenever an initiative to rock the TV watching as a cord cutter and any way to rock the industry, I want to help support that. So I, right. I don't want to see Hulu go away. It's the same reason why um, when Melancholia and Margin Call came out on iTunes, I rented them. To, to support that, as opposed to going to the movie theater, like I want to, I want to help these kind of paradigm changing things. So there, there's the, you know, luckily it's it's not a lot of money, and it's instead of a cup of coffee, I, you know, it's my Hulu Plus subscription. But then I found it in handy. Like I don't like there being any walls to when I want to watch something. So for example, uh, Misfits was a, a UK show that I heard great things. A friend of mine in the UK raved about it, and said you'd really like it. And when I heard it was going to be on Hulu Plus, I'm like, great, I've got my subscription, I can watch it. There's no barrier to me. So that's one of the reasons why I do. I recognize that times are tough and not everybody can afford all these various subscriptions and sometimes you need to pick one horse. But part of what I do for my job, I kind of I feel like I need to have it even though I rarely use it. I mean, and, I, and, and, and I, that's the problem is, is that they, they suffer from an inability to clearly and concisely say what the benefit is. Now, having said that, it's amazing to me that without one a simple one sentence definition of why somebody should get Hulu Plus, they've still managed to get what almost one what half a percent of the entire United States, one point five million subscriptions. When you think about, I guess that's that's probably one percent of all homes in the United States. That's amazing to me. But then, but it's also it goes back to what we're saying about content being king. A friend of mine cut the cord, and he's living off of Hulu, his Hulu Plus subscription and iTunes and things like that. But you know, for whatever reason, NBC and Hulu pulled Thirty Rock off of Hulu Plus, and then he immediately canceled the subscription so yeah, it's, it's you know like it's it's they're definitely on a tightrope and the thing is, is that ultimately if he, my one sentence as to why i was on hulu was to watch misfits was to watch a show it's always going to be it has that show i want and, until, right. and if they can't answer that, if they can't finish that sentence, then they're not going to survive. And so. the networks are going to continue to do that. They're going to yeah. continue to yank things on and off. They're going to overcharge these services for them until they feel competition yeah. coming from originals, from Netflix, from yeah. Hulu, from YouTube, yeah. that sort of thing. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Netflix. Or, uh, no, it's always our sponsor. <laughs> Forget that I said that. <laughs> let's thank our real sponsor, the ones who are with us right now, audible.com. Uh, I don't need to tell you that Audible is a great place to get audiobooks, so I'll let Brian do it. Well, good. Well, as a matter of fact, because uh, I was afraid that if you did the ad, you were going to recommend 1Q84, which you apparently loved, but I wanted a little thing called Plot. And you know where I found it? Not in 1Q84. I found it in Stephen King's new one, 112263. It's a time travel story. Uh, where somebody goes back and tries to stop the assassination of JFK. The reading is phenomenal. This guy, I've got to actually, Craig Wasson, I, it's been a while since I've been utterly blown away by a narrator, but he has this amazing ability to do old characters, to do a southern bell, make her sound attractive. Uh, it's, it's fantastic, and uh, a, lot, what, a lot of King's work kind of suffers in that it starts off amazing, then sort of trails off at the end. Absolutely not. This one totally pays out. He doesn't end with a big mystery. He lets you peek at what might have been if something were to happen. Uh, and uh, I loved it, really enjoyed it. And uh, in fact, it's, it was absolutely free because you sign up, you get one, it only costs one credit. 30 hours and it's only one credit with your Audible subscription. Uh, look, we know a lot of people out there are mm, using nefarious means to get your books. Stop it. Stop it right now. Make sure these guys get paid. Get yourself a subscription. Get one free book. And in fact, you get one for just signing up. Just head on over to audiblepodcast.com slash what? Slash frame rate. Okay, because it says dragon. I don't dragon. know why it says dragon frame <laughs> yeah, in, the, sorry. in the lower third. Uh, that audio is listeners. not. The, and sorry, and possibly if you're watching this in a downloaded version, that will be fixed. Okay, good. But uh, so the is, copy uh, in, in front of me right here says audiblepodcast.com slash frame rate. So do okay, that. Good. Yeah, get on over there. I don't know what dragon up. frame means. In dry, oh, that, that was from the uh, previous promotion about that one book that we're not recommending. We're recommending this book, 112263, yeah. a novel. I apologize <laughs> for the URL confusion. Yeah, don't, don't forget, Audible, uh, 100,000 downloadable titles, all types of literature, periodicals. You can get magazines in there, newspapers as well. Cool. Uh, and I use it all the time when I'm driving. Speeches, so, they have speeches. Yeah. Like they have lot. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah, right. Totally Some old-timey old yeah. radio programs. Love the old-timey radio. Yeah, it's, it's good just stuff. In. Thank you, 
Audible for sponsoring Frame Rate. On now to the slipstream. Do we have it? That's beautiful. It's Isn't like, that great? It's kind of like the social network. Yeah, Kuhan totally put that together for nice us. Nice job, Kuhan. Kuhan. We are into the slipstream. These are some of the uh, the it's bestest, a- streamiest uh, stuff that you can find. Love Film adding ABC TV shows to their archive in the UK. Uh, it's part of that Netflix fight. When you got competition, That's what people happens. start adding more stuff. Yeah. yeah, it should be pointed out that they don't claim that it's an exclusive. So, uh, in fact, there's other services in England that have that are also carrying some of the same programming. But I guess the point of the story is that Netflix doesn't have these, but these guys do. Uh, I got to say, I don't like when everything gets fractious and, and you can watch some things here and some things over there. But, again, I recognize... That's one of the, that's one of the, it's a healthy thing in an emerging market is you got to have a bunch of people jockeying for, for material on it. So I guess it's, it's good in that it shows that, uh, that UK is getting more and more choices. So maybe they'll stop badgering us every time we mention something that's available in the United States. <laughs> uh, if you want to know who's winning in online video, uh, Comscore just released its video rankings for December 2011. Google's YouTube still at the top, as you might expect. Vivo, firmly in second place because of all the music videos, uh, and with roughly a third of the Google audience. Uh, in total, Comscore says 182 million U.S. users watched online video content in December for an average of 23.2 hours per viewer per month. So still well so behind close. television. So close to 24 hours. Yeah, though. so close to <laughs> one day a month. Uh, total U.S. Internet audience viewed 43.5 billion viewers. And what caught Robin Wall Waters eye over at TechCrunch is that Facebook dropped from third place in November to fifth place, trailing behind not only Viacom but Yahoo. Uh, yeah, that doesn't. I'm, I'm not. Oh, su- I was gonna say I'm not surprised by that at all. I mean, Brian, are you yeah, surprised? No, no. I mean, like, there, there's a reason you want your brand to mean something, and Facebook means a lot of things, but it doesn't mean a place to go watch television. But they had rental movies. They, I didn't even know that, did they? Yeah. Wow. Like a year ago. They, they did, but but again, that doesn't mean it. That I don't go to the Home Depot to buy software either. Now, maybe they do have software they, there at the they, Home they Depot. Deer Hunter. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Facebook is not a platform for video. I mean, people post their own videos, and you can link stuff in, from there, but I do not, like, it, it again, it's, it's you know, square peg, round hole. It's like that platform, you know, while it makes sense for them from a business standpoint to try to support video, they're not, clearly not giving it a push. I know that they've done a lot of stuff last year around live events and live video, but that's not going to, that the, the frequency of that wasn't nearly enough to move the needle, clearly. I mean, when you're behind Yahoo, you know, you know your strategy's a little off. Well, and keep in mind, though, from a branding perspective, Yahoo Video is a relatively strong brand in that it's been, I've I've thought of video on Yahoo for almost a decade now. Uh, And so it doesn't surprise me that they're creeping up. To me, the most interesting thing here is uh, Vivo being in second place. I wonder if Vivo doesn't actually have even more views because uh, keep in mind when, when YouTube announces their highest, most popular watched videos, they won't count anything on the Vivo channel on YouTube. They only count the stuff that's kind of homegrown in YouTube because the music video channel, uh, Vivo on YouTube, gets hundreds of millions of views per video. And so I don't know if they're counting these twice or they're just counting Vivo.com. I, they've got to be counting their YouTube numbers, I would think. I mean, the, I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, have you ever been to Vivo.com? I haven't. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, no, a lot of people have, and I, I think we touched on this before, and I think the story that we heard was that they on these on these kind of com score things, they're only talking about vivo.com, wow. and they're not counting the channel. I'm not, I, I could be misremembering it, but I'm pretty sure that was the no, case. No, I think you're right, Brian. Yeah, uh, that's impressive. Greg Sandoval yeah. over at CNET uh, moderated a panel at CES last week, uh, and he has an interesting write-up about how Netflix has pulled out of ultraviolet. Uh, that's the DRM scheme that allows you to watch your movies anywhere you want, but they're still DRM'd. And Amazon has signed on with one studio to deliver Ultraviolet. It's sort of this balance between, well, where are we going to go streaming, or do people still want to buy and collect things even if they're not physical objects? Right. Uh, let me ask you, Ron, because I'm, I'm really conflicted on Ultraviolet. I'm not a fan of DRM by any stretch of the imagination. However... I love my experience with Steam and buying video games. You know, uh, half de- half a decade ago, I was still a bad boy and I would pirate the occasional video game. But since Steam came out, I've gone totally legit. I haven't I haven't e- even been remotely interested because I have. It's so much easier to get what I want when I want, watch it on or play it on any computer. And it sounds like that's what they're offering with Ultraviolet. So I'm really conflicted. I hate DRM, but I love a more Steam-like experience with my movies. Do you have a preference? What does your gut say either way? 
I mean, personally for me, I, I you know, I'm, I'm with you. I, I dislike DRM. I'm a, you know, staunch anti-DRM. Going back to the mu- my days in working in the music industry in the late '90s and early 2000s, and um, you know, it's been great to see you know, kind of the DRM kind of issue in music kind of back off. But in video, I, you know, like it's weird because I haven't fully knocked over. Like I don't pirate. I don't. I don't pirate movies at all. Like that's you know, that that's clearly stealing in my in my mind. Um, but I'm completely okay with streaming. I don't feel the need to digitally own a movie because I know how big that file is. I think about storage. I think about things like that. So I haven't really even thought about uh, DRM around the rights and ownership of a movie file because I'm, I've got you know the fastest speed that Comcast will deliver to my apartment and I'm streaming everything via Netflix or through whatever. So I'm okay with streaming on movies. I don't have that rampant need to buy movies that I once did. I mean, back in but, the day, I had shelves and shelves of DVDs and things like that. The digital, it hasn't really, I haven't really evolved to that point yet. I'll tell you what, though. There's a few movies, though, I wouldn't mind kicking them some bucks. Even though I already own them on DVD, I, would, I wouldn't mind throwing, paying $5 for... Uh, we'll say The Big Lebowski or Fight Club for the ability to, no matter what, always be able to access them. Because it's annoying to me. Like the, the other day, I was trying to explain how great Fight Club was to, uh, to John Tilton. And I went to go to Netflix Instant Streaming, and they had it, but only on DVD by mail. I'm like, ugh, and forget about it. And so I, I, I don't know. I, 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 wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind it for, for that kind of thing. It's not the, the streaminess that worries me. It's the rotating stock nature of, of Netflix Instant Streaming. Well, yeah, and, that, and that's and that's the risk that you run into, and, the, and really the thing is, is that in my mind, the things I want, I'm gonna buy on a disc, and like, and I don't feel, and it's funny because movies, you know, it's a 90 minute, you know, it's a 90 minute commitment. Very rarely in this day, like I'm running out of time to actually work, you know, much less to be like, you know, I kind of want to watch Big Lebowski right now, you know, like that rarely kind of happens. Um, admittedly, it has happened a couple of times. There've been a couple of times where I've really wanted to watch that, that like that thing you do with Tom Hanks, like me and my sister were talking about it. I had to drive to. Barnes and Noble and buy the DVD because I didn't have access to it. So it would be neat to have this digital locker idea. Um, how much I pay for it, though, is another question. Well, Amazon yeah. has it. Right, right exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You, yep. can, you buy a, a movie from Amazon, yeah. it's stored in the cloud. Yeah. Now, it can't play on iOS devices, but right. that's not a problem. But that for said, you, then... and I'm a huge Amazon Prime user. I'm a huge Amazon. I've never I've never played anything from the cloud, any movie. I've never used it. I've, I've yeah. used it. Yeah. I, I see it breaking down as eventually that that rotating stock that you're talking about as a problem goes away. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've, it's gone away with music. Yeah, it's not exactly. Like, you yeah. know, it's not like you have those huge differences in catalog anymore that you used to have in the early days of subscription music. So I think you'll end up with st- something like Netflix where uh, there will be a huge back catalog. Maybe newer movies will be exclusive to one or another platform to give an edge. Uh, but overall, that problem goes away. And then I think what you want to own movies for is movies that you watch a lot. Yep. Uh, that, uh, but but again, well, that you want maybe to hire- you don't need to if they're available all the time on a subscription service. It also depends on how you watch movies. Very rarely do I watch movies on my laptop. I have a very large TV, and I've got great speakers. I have a home theater. I want to watch that, and for some reason in my head, I'm like, well, I'd rather have the Blu-ray disc than stream it. You know, yeah. Even though I know it's streaming HD, I know the quality is there. I feel like I'm getting more data out of the disc. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the, the comparison to music, I mean, we're very much, I think about m- with movies and streaming video content, it's like 2005, 2006 oh, yeah. in, in comparison to music. <laughs> it, may, it, may, it might even be earlier. Yeah. Cause, but, um, but even in 05, 06, we still had DRM on iTunes. We still had catalog issues, things like that. It's gotten to the point now with music where um, an album, like the new Guided by Voices record was exclusive to iTunes. And I was like, oh, it's exclusive? Like I was surprised. Surprised it was exclusive because the, the music has gotten out of that, you know, kind of rhythm. Um, and I right. think movies will follow. So. Uh, more original content coming to the web on Yahoo this time. Tom Hanks planning a web series called Electric City about like a seemingly that. peaceful city. Now, but it should be pointed out it's a seemingly peaceful city in a post apocalyptic future. And uh, I guess it's, I assume, it's one of the few places that actually has electricity and. Uh, amenities that uh, that we associate with uh, civilized society nowadays. Apparently, uh, it's Scranton. This, this sounds great. Well, actually, they they expressly say that that's just a random graphic. That's not actually from the show. But uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'm excited about this. I'm sucker such a sucker for post-apocalyptic uh, dystopian futures. And uh, and Tom Hanks, I think, in general, picks some interesting projects to to get really hands on with. So I, I like. Uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say Tom Hanks can do no wrong, as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Yeah. I, I yeah. like. I like the idea of this. One of these, whether it's uh, whether it's Lily Hammer on Netflix yeah. or House of Cards or one of the Hulu originals or Electric City, one of these is gonna become a hit. They have and to. That's when uh, everything changes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like it's kind of funny because like I'm thinking back. You know, remember Lonely Girl? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, sure. I, I was uh, our I, own Glenn Rubenstein, who was in the building on, recently. Uh, yeah. yeah. Was like, one of the right that it was kind of like imagine if that happened now you know what i mean like we we haven't had <laughs> a show like that really capture the imagination of, of an audience and it's going to happen sooner or later and it's interesting to see more and more names that are recognizable because you think about what does it take to get people to get interested in it, it they need some level of familiarity either a director or a producer or an actor like tom hanks to get involved with the project and so i can't wait for like the the one to hit like and for people the, the water cooler talk to be about a show that was streaming or a show that was on you know a yeah. web only series now, now, on the other side of the uh, coin from that, MySpace, remember MySpace, announced at CES, uh, thanks to Justin Timberlake, that they are going to provide online cable. You will be able to go to MySpace, subscribe, they don't say how much, and they will offer a full suite of TV programming. They don't have any deals with anybody yet. Panasonic. Uh, well, they yeah. have a deal with Panasonic yep. because it will be built into the Panasonic televisions yeah. as an app. But they don't have any deal with content providers yet. Right. Uh, but it would be like a satellite service where it would be okay. nationwide it's and you'd get cable channels. Yeah. Uh, there, there, is, there is a certain amount of grain of salt you have to take an announcement at DS with. There's also a certain amount of grain of salt that you have to take an announcement from MySpace with. There's also a certain amount of grain of salt that you have to take anyone who makes an announcement of big sweeping changes without any existing deals in place. It's like this is a nexus of, of, of doesn't pass the smell test. There's no way. I will go on the record. I will buy both you guys Omaha steaks if this comes to pass. There's no way. I'm, I'm calling it. This is, this is bluff and bluster. To make noise on on a property, they don't got the goods I'm on this. In it's, my space back. it's a lot. It's a lot of grains of salt there. That's a, you got a lot of salt. <laughs> I agree with you. I don't. I mean, it's sad. I mean, they're dumping so much money into this, and they're trying to do what they can. But can anything? Will anything ever happen in MySpace that will not get us to react in this way? Well, I, I actually I actually think that MySpace has bottomed out, and I think that they're finally uh, recognizing where they actually are, what assets they do have, and they are they're they're sort of getting that dead cat bounce now because they got new owners, right? They uh, Fox sold them off or News yeah, Corp. Yeah, no, it's Justin Timberlake and his group of people who own it now. Yeah. Right. So I I actually think in the future I see good things for MySpace because they do have an infrastructure and they do have a background. The problem is they got they got a, a terrible name and reputation for uh, they ruined the brand value of it when it went away and, and it turned out it was not a trend but a fad but uh but i actually do think there's going to be good things for myspace i don't think this is it i don't think i think they're barking up the wrong tree i think you might be right i mean it's funny because myspace has always been at least the saving grace of myspace was the bands was music yes and like there are so many great bands and that's to completely faded now as far as i'm with things like Bandcamp and things like that like yeah. i very rarely do i go to a band's myspace page anymore to go find their tour dates or something like that so they got to do something so if they think tv's the way to go i mean it makes sense to do it at ces <laughs> yeah it's yeah, the only exactly. way they got any, any attention yeah uh let's move on to tube tops Talks about the devices that sit on the top of your tube and deliver the things from the tube to your tube. <laughs> and we're starting off with Broadcom, a chip. This is going to put Slingbox in everything. Several pay TV operators debuted iPad apps with streaming video in 2011, according to That's Not Funny. Uh, Broadcom is going to integrate EchoStar's Sling place shifting tech into a Broadcom chip, so you'll be able to make set top boxes like Motorola makes. That will just come with Sling. Now, how did it take this long? Because Echo Star didn't want anyone else to use it. <laughs> exactly. Because they own Sling. <laughs> exactly. And they only wanted to have dish boxes have this. Yeah. True. I, exactly. mean, this is, I mean, it's a great idea. And it's, it's the kind of thing where it's like Sling has such great, such a great platform that I'm surprised, I'm surprised it took this long. So Yeah. yeah I, this, is, this is huge. I, I think this is the kind of thing in two years, you're going to see this logo on every set-top de de device. It was, it's, the, it's the right product. It works. It works consistently. It's, uh, it's well-beloved by everyone who uses it. And there's, uh, the only thing that, that we don't like about it is that it's another thing to put on, on top of another thing. And if it can come inside, then I, I think it, it, we're all going to love it. How about a thing that you stick inside another thing? No. <laughs> Stop what you're thinking. I'm talking about the Roku streaming stick. Uh, which is a set-top box in, not helping. <laughs> in a in a USB size, like a USB thumb drive size device. This goes into your HDMI port on the back of your television. And if it has, if your television has MHL, which is mobile high-definition link, you will then be able to get anything over the air uh, streamed into your television, uh, as well as any app that is on Roku, streamed to your television. So instead of hooking up the Roku box, uh, 
Yep. You just have this thing in the back, and now you got Netflix, and you got uh, Crackle, and you got Twit, and, cool. and basically anything on your Roku without having to have the big old box. You just plug it in. It's and that, now how now is it just through the technology is getting more miniature? Like how can they? Like does doesn't this eliminate the need for a Roku box? It does yeah. if you have a television have a te- that has MHL. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's the difference. That's the thing. Yeah, I, I, I feel like this is a uh, this is a really cool technology, but I feel like the consumer facingness of it and explaining how to use it and what the, it's it's really kind of might be kind well, of really narrow. The other part of it too, though, is it's going to demonstrate to TV vendors, hey, you could build this into your television. Yep. Stop trying to make up your own app ecosystem. Build Roku right inside. Well, it's funny because we were talking on All About Android this morning about Google TV and how generally I, I would say my position is is that I want my monitor to be dumb. I want I, I don't want any any stock apps or any OS or anything like that. I just want it to be a plain monitor and then allow me to pick the uh, Brian celebrating. Allow me to pick the set top boxes and things I want to go into it. Brian, you agree or? Oh, no, no, I've been saying on this show, I've been banging the drum for over a year now that I want my, my display to do absolutely one thing and do it exquisitely well, and that's show pretty pictures. Leave everything else to the boxes I attach to it. Yeah, and give me a ton of inputs. Or give me the opportunity. Give me the, you know, different ways to change things and things like that. But the monitor itself should be devoid of any sort of technology baked in because ultimately you'll be limited and tied to whatever ecosystem or whatever manufacturer that is. Um, right. But the, the complaint to that, the devil's advocate, is, is that people don't want a cabinet full of boxes. And they don't want, I'm sure you can attest, to, you got you, you, you oh, your Roku's, yeah. you got your boxes, you got your Apple TVs, you got your Google TVs, you got all these kind of things. If the form factor is going to slim down to a dongle, that's pretty darn cool. So. And you could swap it out. Yeah, exactly. And so this whole idea of, like, should it be built into the TV or not could go away. Yeah. Because you just pull it out. You know, I can't, you know, it's, it, I, I, the times we, I hate to be like, oh, I'm so old. But, like, when I got TV in my bedroom when I was, like, 12, I stole one of my dad's old computer monitors. And I ran the cable to my room and routed, you know. Imagine somebody could just get a TV and plug in this thing. And you can, if your kid's in trouble, you just remove the Roku dongle and be like, you're grounded. No Roku for a week. No. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they left. Just a dumb TV. Oh, my God, that's great. Yeah. No Al Jazeera for you. <laughs> <laughs> no Russia today, sir. <laughs> that's it. You're cut off. Uh, uh, taking a uh, tip from Broadcom, uh, also at CES, Google TV to be built into Marvell's system on a chip. Uh, and it was being showed off in a set-top box device as a concept, but the idea that, again, uh, set-top box manufacturers can make their own set-top boxes with Google TV right there on the Marvell chip. Yep. I mean, it's it's it makes sense, you know, and then and then it's another stream of license fees and profit for the makers for Google and Echo Star and that and, you know that sort of thing. So I mean, it's cool. I mean, it, but then that said, that kind of goes against what I just said by having this software be on the chip. But still, here's, here's, here's the difference. The difference is is uh, I, I think we're both on the same page as far as what we personally want on our televisions are there, there to be done. However, I think we're also both for including Google TV on every television that goes out because I want the Google TV platform to be successful. And if this is a way to expose more people to it, then so much the better. But personally, you know, I'd, I'd rather have it be a more powerful outside box attached. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, if a, cable, if a cable service had Google TV in the cable box, that would be a, a thumbs up for me. That, that would yeah. make me go be a customer because of that. Uh, Google also announced at CES LG, Samsung, and Vizio partnerships. So yeah. that Eric Schmidt talk about six months most of the TVs you see are gonna have Google TV still sounds optimistic but not quite so crazy no I, I mean yeah way not so more crazy and actually more realistic if I think I think in the summer when you walk into Best Buy you're gonna see a lot of Google TV lo- icons and things like that and I think it's great I mean before CES I I mean for the past couple of months I've been very bullish on Google TV I've been very um, supportive of it and I can't tell you how relieved I was when CES rolled around and all these products got announced because I, I don't want to be wrong but um, it's a good platform, and I think that Google's finally putting some support behind it. They're kind of putting their money where their mouth is with these deals. Bloomberg Businessweek uh, reported that Google will introduce the next version of Google TV this year. Remember, it took them a long time to get to this current version that just came out, which is a huge improvement. Uh, and the company cites Google spokesman Chris Dale and director Rishi Chandra, who said the company intends to keep inter- iterating. They're going to, according to this article on The Verge, give you an upgrade every year. So if you buy a Google TV, you're going to have a new television every year without having to buy a new television. That's pretty cool. Well, and actually, that does kind of relieve. My biggest complaint is that we buy televisions in, you know, five-year cycles. And that's why I'm against, uh, in general, having anything built into the TV. But if the software does keep on uploading and if, if 
the uh, the hardware running the Google TV has enough horsepower to it to where you it, it feels like an upgrade every time and not like uh, like uh, you know remember every time a new version of iOS came out your poor Gen One iPhone just got chunkier and slower and stupider and less usable that's what I'm afraid will happen but as long as that's not the case. Uh, maybe this could be a place where uh, where you can upgrade your television without buying a new one. Well, I think I mean I think the biggest challenge to that is um, vi you know how much more high resolution is video going to get? You know, like are we going to go beyond HD and you know oh, yeah. and the, the current HD 4K. standards? 4K, right? Exactly. So the question is, in five years, will you know will the rendering engines and, and the hardware on, in these boxes be able to churn and do that? I mean. You know, I, I I think we're at the highest level of quality we're gonna get. Of course, they're always gonna come up with some new thing that that we're gonna need, and oh, it makes it look so much better at 3D or whatever I, it is. But I think, at least for now, I think we're in pretty good shape. I actually have a prediction regarding 4K. I don't know if I've told you this, Tom, but uh, the only way 4K is going to be a success is if they stop framing it as television. HD TV will be the last time we think of something as television. At 4K, we begin to sell video walls as a totally different thing. We sell them as ambient background, as, as uh, you know, uh, to, to enhance the space you live in. Think of Total Recall. We got to frame it as something besides a television. And instead, uh, if, if you frame it as that, I think in the next four years, we'll be seeing home units. That's not what they were doing at CES this year. They were framing it as television. Like, I didn't say they were doing it it will not be it will not be a success because people okay. are tired of iterating slightly better on their displays and you got to call it something different you got to you got to I don't know I, th I I felt this I felt that same skepticism until I walked up and saw yeah. the television and then I drooled and wanted to buy one this was <laughs> not like 3D where I went well that's not bad I'm not sure I really want to spend for another upgrade for a stupid thing right. this this was drool worthy yeah uh, well no I I believe it'll be good but but I think in order to make it a commercial success, in order to get people to see it in the display centers, you got to call it something. You got to define a new category. No, Brian, man, you haven't seen it. You don't understand, <laughs> man. It's crazy, man. All right. I'll get uh, one called. They could call it potato salad. I'll take twelve. <laughs> uh, let's move on to film foul. This is not your father's film film, okay? This is not the old film film that was only about films. This is no. film film that is about everything that yes, you watch. This is, this is the content section. Yes. We talked about the technology. We talked about the boxes that sit on your tubes. Now we're talking about what you watch on your tubes. And we don't care. We're totally uh, ambivalent, whether you see it with your eyes on a screen uh, in a theater or in your hands or on a streaming or on the disc. Hey, wait, wait, wait. hey man, that's your, that's your bag. Whatever. We just want to talk about what you're looking at. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad you threw this one in the lineup. Frank Darabont's <laughs> plan for Walking Dead Season 2 revealed. Yeah, this was... Uh, no, okay, guys, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, obviously, we've talked a lot about The Walking Dead, and uh, we all felt like the first four episodes were really super slow, and, of course, those were the ones that Darabont worked on. Uh, and uh, I was skeptical of how the show was going to go, and, of course, once Darabont was off the case, the, the episodes got better uh, in the second season. But this is one of those little peeks into what might have been he describes how he wanted the first episode of season two to be a completely self-contained episode that took place before the apocalypse occurred about uh, about this um uh, this elite platoon that they kind of have things under control he basically said black hawk down in the zombie apocalypse they got things under control but they just need to get from point a to point b a few blocks away and just everything spirals out of control they get they get surrounded and they eventually start getting picked off and the, it ends with one actor finally making it into their tank and uh and then he goes uh he's but he's bit and you realize at the end of the episode it flashes forward and that's the backstory of the one zombie who is in the tank that Rick Grimes found at the end of, uh, uh, I think it was like the second episode of the, or, or the first episode of the pilot as well. The idea of having a whole episode telling this epic backstory to this one character to to reinforce the fact that these aren't just things, monsters walking around. Each one has a compelling tale. And unfortunately, they took a similar idea. They totally nerfed it, made it a web series. Uh, I think this would have been epic. And in fact, the actor 
who uh, who was in who was the zombie? I, I forget the guy's name, but he's a reasonably well-known actor. He uh, was uncredited in the first episode; just did it as an extra because they wanted it to be a so total surprise when he was the lead on the premiere episode of season two. That would have been amazing. I think that would have been a blast, and it's a shame that it never really happened. I, I think you're being a little generous. I think what? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I read it as well, and I, it's a lot. It's, it's way easy for Darabont to say this is what I would have done, especially after the first part of season two wrapped up and had a lot of criticism, things like that. Um, and I, I feel like too many people would th would call lost fouls, you know, in terms of flashbacks and things like that. I mean, it, sound, it does sound like a fun idea, fun way to go. But if that was the first episode of the of the season, I think people would have gone berserk. I think they would. Oh, you know. no way, dude. Uh, okay, you watched this last season. Can yeah. you honestly say? You would rather have the way it turned out than than to have this as be the first episode. I will admit, I will admit. Um, and now it's this is, this hits a little close to home. We should do this, you know. Uh, well, yeah, you know. and it should be full disclosure. I mean, you've you've been uh, you, you've interviewed uh, Kirkman several times on iFanboy. You guys seem pretty tight. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, so so I, I'm a little close to the sub to the subject matter. So sure, I, th sure. that said, I was very frustrated with parts of season two. I thought um, some things uh, took a little longer than they needed to. But that said, when all said and done, when that last episode finished, I was totally satisfied. Thought it totally paid off. Thought they pulled it off. I thought it was clear you could see the challenge of Darabont leaving and the 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 the, the new showrunners kind of getting their feet on on uh, on the ground and figuring out what they're doing. Um, but I you know I think a lot of people were way and what well, a lot of people were way harsher than they need to and there's an interesting thing and brian i want to get your opinion of this um fans of the comic book are the worst kind of fans for this tv show because we're the ones who are ultra critical oh of no it. I, I think we've made brian yeah. and i've made that clear okay yeah yeah okay yeah because because there are normal there are normal people who just know it from the tv show and they love it yeah and not only that but it's totally gotten into the zeitgeist and like to the point where i was in chicago and i heard on sp sports radio and they made a walking dead reference while talking about college football and it's like when yeah. that happens then something's a success i think now well, this is just fanboys kind of arguing and nitpicking a little well and, and at this point and we've talked about this before at the, by the end of, of, of where we are now in season two i feel like the television show is utterly and completely divorced from the comic book i feel like we'll have echoes and things that rhyme with what happened in the comic book but is clearly its own story at this point yeah all right let's uh take a moment to congratulate the winners of the international academy of web television awards they were announced in las vegas during ces uh we previewed a lot of these oh. on our special edition of frame rate at the end of the year uh the guild took home, I don't know, what did, what did the guild Everything. took like five uh, awards in various categories. In fact, there was a really funny uh, moment where Jeff Lewis, uh, who was in the guild, also was nominated in the same category for the Jeff Lewis five-minute comedy hour. He went up to accept the award and said, I didn't hear which one I won for. <laughs> Uh, so that was actually one of the better moments. Uh, Receiver, which we mentioned on the Frame Rate special, uh, won for Best Drama Web Series. The Guild won for Best Comedy Web Series. Uh, the Web File for Best Hosted Tape Series. Uh, What's Trending with Shira Lazar took home three awards. Uh, Best Hosted Live Web Series was one of those. Best Animated Web Series, Red vs. Blue. Best Documentary Web Series, White Collar Brawler. Uh, and and the news goes on. Uh, oh, the hey, and of course, don't, don't, no, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Yeah, no, no, no. Tech News Today won for best news website. Congratulations. Don't make too big of a deal out well of it, deserved. but we were very, very happy to get that. What was the? What, was this just? Was this just giving awards for giving? No, not to take anything away from your award, sure, but sure. but was this just giving awards was this for a giving? Random drawing, or was this? Or was this? Because because uh, not not to not to be you know sour grapes, but I saw a comic book orange one for best writing nonfiction. Yeah. And they haven't put out an episode. You have you had to submit. Okay, so you had to and submit. And it was for the past eighteen months. Okay, so that's fair. All right, cool. Yeah. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, Although yeah. I, I do want to give a quick uh, shout out to uh, our buddies over at Dad Labs. Uh, shot oh, right yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Those guys are fantastic. Yeah, they did a great. Uh, they did a great job as well. And, in fact, I'll, go to iawtv.org if you want to see all the folks. Yeah, Casey McKinnon, uh, yeah, Comic one. Book Orange, uh, Rudy won for best writing a nonfiction. So congratulations to them, of yeah, course, that's great. as well. On to <clears throat> Frequency, a TV guide for web video. Now, we've seen a lot of people trying to tell you where to find different videos on the web. Uh, Frequency has uh, recently been featured in All Things D. Uh, it's a slicker redesign. It's been around for a while. And the idea is if you're looking for any kind of video on the web, uh, Frequency is your guide to finding it. It's not just about movies or big broadcast TV shows. It looks slick. I mean, from what little I'm able to see here. I didn't bother to actually try it out yet, though. 
Yeah, no, it, it looks really cool. I just feel like this 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 kind of application comes out every six months or so, where someone's like, "We're going to be your place for web video and that sort of thing." And I feel like it become. I, I've never heard of one of these. You know, there's Clicker and there's all these other kind of websites and things like that that are going to control your, not help you know, suggest and make recommendations. And it just feels like they never really get get traction. They never really get people behind it. We're like, "Oh, I found this great thing from this." You know, um, right. and I don't know why. I mean, it's just it's because it's a good idea, but for some reason, it just hasn't quite captured that experience of self-discovery. Or you just, you know, I me a link and saying, "Hey, check this out." Like nobody's been able to replicate that. Yeah. Right now, right. Brian, you found a way to catch up on the entire series of Fringe in less than an hour. Okay, yeah, no. Here's the thing. This was, and this isn't put together by a fan or nothing. This is actually put out by Fox. Uh, if you click on, um, uh, I, I guess we'll give the link in the show notes here. But it's called Fringe: Past, Present, and Future, and it basically takes you through a series of short videos. You can see here: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They're all narrated by the actual guy, and they take you through the whole experience. Wait, what actual guy? Uh, I don't know the crazy one whose name I can't remember. Oh, John Noble. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's the guy. But, Walter. But it, like, uh, yes, Walter. There you go. That's the one. But like... Uh, Lord Denethor. <laughs> that is him. Yeah. I, I always wonder who he was. Father's choice to save his child, so, no matter what the cost. That's here's really my, cool. And it's here's from Fox. Dilemma. I want no. to... Um, I want to give Fringe its due, but I'm defeated by the utter size of how many episodes I'd have to watch to, to properly do everything. And I'm half tempted to spend the hour to just to just get caught up on the whole story so I could love it the way you guys do, but I feel like I would be wimping out. Um, I, I need a, an up or down vote from the chat room on whether I have permission to skip watching all this and at least just get to the point where I'm fully infected like you guys so that I can uh, I can enjoy it like it's everyone else. like our world, but slightly different. That's Spoiler right. alert, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to vote, I'm gonna vote okay. thumbs down on that, Brian. I think you got to watch the show. I think this is cheap. Oh, my God, though. There's so many. There's so many. Everyone Where are it. you? You're in season two? I'm in halfway through season two, and, and there's like six it? episodes. Oh, I, I mean, I, again, I, I like it. I have the same reaction I had with X-Files. I love the, the tales that are part of the bigger, larger stories, but I just, you know, endure the Monster of the Week things. No, keep going. Monster of the Week gets less and less. In fact, now it's like not even there anymore. You know, it's it's actually funny because I had that same problem with Buffy the Vampire Slayer, mm. um, where because I because you know Buffy is this great, this this great you know great property and all this sort of stuff. And I'd watch like a little bit of season one. That was it. And actually, an iFanboy uh, mem uh, fan uh, emailed me and gave me watch these episodes. These are the only episodes you need to. And he filtered out the Monster of the Week stuff. So maybe. It, it, this is kind of similar. If someone can do that, Brian, then maybe you can, right. you know, figure out some sort of, you know, these are the episodes you need to watch. So at least you're watching them all. You yeah, know, don't all skip. I'm yeah. Don't hold skip. Off on, on your recommendation, but seriously, if if somebody wants to just dive in and at least what under, understand what everyone else is talking about it, it's obvious that the folks at Fox really want to bring people in, even at this late stage of Fringe, to get them into the show. And in the past, present, future, very slickly produced, and it seems to be telling the story very directly. <laughs> That's a really cool thing that Fox is doing there. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a hoarder. So <laughs> I'm going to recommend that you watch every me, single minute of every video. Me too. I'm, and keep the paper that you take notes on. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, let me real quick. Ron, did you ever watch, and we'll talk about this and what we're watching, but did you, did you ever watch Avatar The Last Airbender? No. Oh, you're a bad person. Nope. And, and, and everyone else makes fun of me because it's a kid's show on Nickelodeon, but uh, easily one of the most epic and awesome stories. They released some footage of the upcoming, the new Avatar series called The Legend of Korra, uh, and uh, take a look at this. I this is on io9. I thought this looked freaking phenomenal. Hold on, let's go ahead and there we go. You think you are? Why don't you come and find out? And we got to take down notice. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I mean, this is released. It's promotional footage to promote it. But, uh, uh, dude, it's it's looking so good. It's good stuff. I've heard great things about the show. I mean, it's it's got a rabid fan base. I mean, like, and not just kids. I mean, even though it's kind of a kids thing. I mean, there I know a lot of adults who are fans of that uh, of that uh, that property. Yeah. Okay. For the last time, let's check in on the NSFW show frame rate winter movie draft. Oh no. No intro. There it is. The winter movie draft doesn't officially end until tomorrow.
Brian Brushwood. Uh, dude, it's a nail biter at the end. You realize Glenn was ahead of me just yesterday, and then I eked out. Of, I'm like like 35 cents ahead of him right now. So it's like, I mean, you're obviously champion, 470 million. But look at this. It's a difference of $300,000 between me and Glenn now. Um, I, I think I'm barely going to eke out a second place victory. Then Glenn right behind me. And then just behind that is Sarah and Justin dead last with $255 million. And we or all Jeff. thought Sarah was going to be contending for the top because she got those last two uh, movies uh, for cheap. For cheap. Yeah, well, she spent all of her money and uh, and had the most number of movies, so we figured that that meant an easy victory, but apparently that's not the case. I uh, can't uh, wait uh, to uh, get my money. I also can't I wait for the summer movie draft. That seems like so oh, much fun. Oh, yeah. I've never done be, one of we, those. We should, we should yeah, you, I would gladly do that. Yeah, I'll put my money thing. right now this. Yeah, yeah. 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 all right. <laughs> uh, let's check in on what we're watching. <laughs> watching so i am uh re-watching with my daughter for the third time i'm going through the entire series of avatar the last airbender you heard me talk about it just a bit i'm excited because legend of Korra is coming out uh, i am dead serious it is one of the most enchanting worlds the writing is beautiful the uh the the storytelling is amazing and the fight scenes are super badass it's amazing the uh, you should read some of the articles about how they do the fight choreography and the different types of uh, earth bending uh, fire bending instead of are all based on different forms of martial arts very very well thought out but uh, but i don't want to talk about that i want to talk about season two of Sherlock, that the whole How can you world... possibly talk about season two of Sherlock? It hasn't aired in the United States, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to talk about. We, 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 uh, help me out here. I need, I need a moral compass. I got an ethical dilemma here because enough people were just hammering me on, you got to watch Sherlock, you got to watch Sherlock season two. And, uh, and I got as far as actually loading up the BitTorrent client. It just felt dirty to, to, to grab it from, from England. And then people were talking about, oh, you can watch it on iPlayer. And I go there and it says, oh, yeah, no, hell, welcome to BBC. It's the iPlayer. Uh, you're in America, so you can't watch. And then I, uh, I ended up VPNing and pretending using a VPN that routed my traffic through London. And so it says, oh, you're from London. Great. You're Sherlock. And I watched it. And I'm like, it, it, how, how bad of a person am I for uh, not BitTorrenting, not stealing? But, yeah, you I mean, didn't you, steal. They, they got the credit. They got the uh, they uh, got the advertising. Oh, did, did, you pay, did you pay the license fee? Uh, I don't to support know. the BBC. Oh no, I guess not. Yeah, that's your only ethical dilemma there. Yep. Well, can I mail them a check for thirty-five cents? You should totally do that just to just to kick off the Brazil-like bureaucracy problem <laughs> when the BBC gets a check for thirty-seven cents from an American, and they're like, "Well, but we can't cash this." And it'll get, it'll get passed luck. around. Yeah. The check will be in a plastic bag and through pneumatic tubes in the BBC, and like, and seriously, it'll never get cashed. Uh, okay, well, I'll tell you this much. It's freaking amazing. It's so much better than anything in the. It's the first episode of the second season is better than the first whole season combined. It is so, so very good. I mean, they finally got it with Doctor Who. They said, we'll put it out at virtually the same time. Yep. Uh, and, and they've gotten it with some other uh, shows in the opposite direction, where they put them out at virtually the same time. I don't understand well, why it, May yeah. or Downton Abbey, same well, way, why months later. Thing is well, so offensively far and with no valid reason whatsoever. That's the part that kills me. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, like with, with Downtown Abbey, it's, it's a similar thing where I, I, a friend procured it from England and watched the whole season two and then I see everyone talking about it the season two premiering and I'm like but it's over already right. like it's mm -hmm. definitely confusing and I, it's got to be with licenses and all that sort of stuff yeah. and I mean because BBC America even though it has BBC in it is not the BBC they're, they're independent even though they're, they're cousins or sisters or whatever they're you know it has to do with all that kind of stuff and plus Sherlock is somewhat untested I think the fact that the fact that all us early adopters love it um, but it's we'll see how long it took Doctor Who to come come over at the same time it's yeah, gonna take yeah. a while for Sherlock too so. what do you been watching what have i been watching um well a little bit of confession i've been watching and i have a conundrum as well but um back when i when i was a teenager my parents wouldn't let me have a tv in my room until i was 14 so i went to radio shack and i bought a little am fm tv audio like radio kind of thing and i'd sit there with the headphones in i would listen to channel 7 because that was the only over the air station i could get on long island and so i would sit there and listen to channel 7's tv shows and this is late 80s and one of the shows i would listen to was 30 something 
Which, yeah. Which I don't know, at 12 or 13, I should have been listening to 30-something. But um, I was browsing Netflix, and I saw that they had it on streaming. And, I, you know, I was uh, we're, there are no more shows on the winter, you know, kind of everything's on hiatus. So and I go to the gym. I like to watch TV at the gym. So I started watching 30-something to see what it would like me now being 30-something to watch 30-something to see if it really resonated. And it's actually re- – it's by the people who did My So-Called Life. They went, later went on to do My So-Called Life and, and uh, another show, I forget, like Brothers and Sisters or Now and Again or some of the, one of those kind of shows. Um, and it's really good drama. And it kind of – it's like I feel like if it came out now, it would be like very Mad Men-esque and a lot of people talking about it, buzzing about it, you know, kind of water cooler kind of moments and that sort of thing. But my conundrum is there are four seasons. Season one and two were both streaming and on discs on Netflix – Streaming three, not every episode is streaming, but the discs are there. So what I'm doing is I'm queuing up the discs and I'm so because I got to watch it in order. Season four, like ten episodes are streaming and they don't have the discs. Oh. So I can't not finish the series. So now I'm looking I, on like Amazon to buy season I mean, four like, or something like that. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I I don't know. And that's an interesting discussion because in that situation. By that fourth season, I think you're 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 moving into bootleg territory where it's just like there's there's no way to get it. It's like a live concert of the Grateful Dead in Philly in '69 or whatever. Exactly. That doesn't like, make it legal, but I know what you're saying. I, no, no, but but, but yeah. it does. Uh, there's a difference between legal and ethical, though, too. I mean, that's the other big question: is what's ethical and what's 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 legal? Welcome uh, to philosophy. Not, but, but, but there's also there's also the challenge of what happens when you skirt the edge of popular culture so far that you can't even get it through illicit means, which I think is going like to happen. The pilot episode of Ten Speed and Brown Shoe, for instance, exactly not on the DVD. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I mean, uh, I, we should we should have like some kind of segment where we just break down the difference between legal or ethical on a whole bunch of different scenarios. We should have people write in a challenge. In fact, maybe that'll be fun next week. Write us a specific challenge and and we'll give our rulings on legal or ethical or none of the above. And bonus points for citing Immanuel Kant. Uh, <laughs> I, I am watching Fringe came back to television. Very excited. Loved the return episode. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Won't say anything more about it. Uh, and also Being Human premiered yeah, on sci-fi last night. The U.S. version, right? The U.S. Yeah. version, which I find to be as enjoyable as the British version. I love them both. Uh, in, the, in the U.S. version, I think Sally's story is really cool starting off this season. Uh, Josh's story is pretty much a, a distant echo of George's story from the U.K. version. Uh, not that I don't like it, but not much difference there. Aiden's story is a lot different, and I'm not certain that I like it yet. I'm kind of easing I, i'm hold, withholding judgment on that but uh i i recommend being human i think it's a great uh, great I've series heard nothing but good things about that show yeah. let's move on to feedback now it's time for feedback with brian and tom on same radio yeah brian you pick a couple of feedbacks to read then we'll, we'll bug out of here all right, uh, we'll wrap it up here pretty quick. Uh, hey, Brian and Tom, you guys often talk about teasers and trailers and such. I hear this distinction a lot, as well as other types of trailers, such as theatrical and so on. So my question is, ex- what exactly do these types mean? Is there something in the formula of the trailer that distinguishes them? Or is the distinction purely based on meta characteristics, such, characteristics such as when it's released, where it's shown, et cetera? Uh, I actually picked this because I think it's interesting how much of industry lingo, thanks to the Internet, is now kind of common geek speak. Uh, in general, like uh, the, the the normal people, the viewers out there call them previews, but projectionists call them trailers. And you got your full-length theatrical trailer because obviously uh, you can spend two minutes before a movie comes out to tell more of the story to entice people to go to the movie. But then there's teaser trailers, which are usually only 15 to 30 seconds long and don't actually have very much, if any, of the footage from the actual show. But I thought that was a really interesting question. Like I just assumed everybody knew what all this meant. Uh, do, do you guys feel like uh, like nowadays we're more hip to industry lingo, or are we just in the industry so we see it differently? No, no, I think I think you're right in that the, the, these terms and these lingo that were industry stuff are now being adopted by normal people, and they're using them now within the marketing. Um, I think I always saw a teaser as almost a trailer for the trailer. You know, because the, te- yeah. the teaser is always shorter, shows much less. There's not so much a narrative where a trailer. There's actually there. There's a narrative to a trailer. I mean, like that. that it is crafted to serve a certain purpose, and it tends to be longer. And I think that's a normal process for yeah. industry jargon to work its way. I, yeah. I, we see it in technology all the time. All the time. So it's yeah. not surprising that this is happening, especially with our access to this material yeah. so much greater than it was when we actually had to go to the theater to see it. Right. Uh, and, and also, I had a couple other really good emails, but we don't have time for them. Uh, maybe I'll save them for next time. But uh, this one says from Chimera, 
Ryan and Tom, on episode 58, you talked about Filmon's new over-the-air tuner for iOS and Android devices. There's a variety of use uh, cases that can be made for this tuner, but the one that is foremost in my mind is emergencies. In emergency situations, radio is still king, but TV can be a vital communications link. Last year in Connecticut, we were hit by tropical storm Irene and a freak October snowstorm within a nine-week span. Irene left 830,000 utility customers powerless for up to a week, and the October storm left 850,000, including me, without power for 10 days. Before the digital transition, there used to be a wide variety of portable TVs. They're still around, but they cost about as much as the film on air, have bad screens, and only about two hours of battery life. Having a tuner like this and leveraging the phone or tablet I already have is pretty attractive to me. That just might find a place in my home between the MREs and the bottled water. Thanks, Chimera Dan. Uh, this is a really good point. Uh, although, in an emergency, I would think that the information you really care about would be just as well transmitted on radio. Yeah, and, and you know like, what? Your electrical needs uh, could be compromised, which means you're probably not going to be wanting to run a whole computer just to get an emergency signal. That's why well, no, crank, no, no. He, he's crank talking radios. About Yep. He's talking about for Android devices because you would have eight hours of charge on your tablet. You'd be able to use it as a television to get your services. Will on you that. have eight hours of charge on your tablet? For sure. And how quickly will, will that your battery go? have run down? How quickly does film on use it faster? I'm just crank radio means you never run out of power as long as you got an arm. The whole the whole in case of emergency scenario now because even with phones like you know like I don't if power goes out I don't have a landline anymore I don't have any sort of you know like, you know uh, they they had uh, a product at CES uh, I can't remember what it's called but it was a little cell phone uh, with double A batteries and. It was meant to be put into your emergency pack, yep. and you pop your SIM card from your actual phone in there, oh, cool. and you can use AA batteries because they're ubiquitous. Oh, wow. And then That's make brilliant. emergency calls. Yeah. Although, wait, by that logic, why wouldn't you just get one of those battery packs for iPhones and that takes AA batteries? I say, it, it, when you're talking about emergency, it's like basically saying everything has failed. What is the thing most likely to work? If everything else has failed, this is most right. likely to work because you only need a couple AA batteries. This ties back into The Walking Dead. Yeah. So, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> your smartphone was crushed by the dinosaur <laughs> that is invading your planet. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, if you guys want to chime in, hit us up at frameratio at gmail.com. That's frameratio at gmail.com. Don't do framerate at gmail.com because that's that poor guy who has to forward him over to us. Do, do not, do not. To do framerate show at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. We will see you next time. Oh, wait, Ron, iFanboy.com. Yeah. Go to iFanboy.com. You'll find me there. Yes. Go follow him on Twitter. <laughs> Ronxo. R-O-N-X-O. Yeah, Ronxo. About.me slash Ronxo. All right. Now we can go. Bye, everybody.